This part here talks about the power of prayer. And I want to talk about prayer today because prayer is important for all of us, for a resource, right? I want to go over it. I think, I think God was showing me some good things in, in my studies lately and other things throughout life. Let's look at that key text. I do believe it's a key text. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. It's a, it's a verse all of us can quote. But I think it's a key for how our communication with God is supposed to go. I do. And I'll give you some of the reasons why. Look at Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. We all need to pray. We're all going to need to pray today. We're going to need to pray tomorrow. But what should we expect in return? I think a lot of people who weren't raised in church or get away from the Word of God, they are confused about what prayer is. Thanks for joining us. I knew we were missing somebody. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And then I like 7 too. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. In fact, with those three verses, I think you see about everything you need to know about prayer. It's about not leaning to our own understanding, right? So the very fact we're praying is saying that we realize that there's a limitation to our own understanding. We need some help. That's a good starting point, right? And then in verse 6, we acknowledge God just simply by praying, by the fact that you stopped and prayed, whether it was eloquent, not eloquent, or you even knew what you were doing, the fact that you acknowledged God is key. And then how does God respond? The end of verse 6 says, And he shall direct thy path. I think that's how prayer works. We're going to talk about all the details of it in a second. But you acknowledge God and he directs your path. One thing I'm going to hit throughout our, our little lesson today on prayer is that I don't want us to be a church or a people that are sign seekers. I do believe it's, it's absolutely wrong. And so like I say, sometimes you, you shouldn't look for a sign in the sky, you know, something that goes across the sky that says, you should go to church today. Um, we also shouldn't be sign seekers in our heads. I don't think we should. Because we can trick ourselves. And there's a little bit of wiggle room here. But what I'm saying is, you know, you're praying for something. God, you know, help me make the right decision. And then, well, the very first thing that popped in my head was to go out and buy that Ferrari. Well, because it was already in your head. Your head can mess you up, you know what I mean? I don't like that. I don't like to say the very first thing that came upon my mind or, you know, God, I've used the terminology before, God impressed upon my mind. But be careful with it because your mind is just like everything else. It's fickle. It's emotion. It's actually just chemicals. Your mind isn't your soul. You know that? It's your mind isn't your soul. So the things that flash through your head could absolutely be wrong. A prayer life is more about acknowledging God and having Him direct your life. Not necessarily saying that I'm arriving at some conclusions, like even doctrinal things, like, Lord, help me know this doctrine, help me know the answer. And all of a sudden, God flashed across your mind the exact wording for that doctrine, right? Not usually how it works. Usually, God, Lord, help me find the answer on this doctrine. And God could work through a number of means. You could hear a sermon on it, you go in your devotions, you read another passage that, wow, that kind of was lining up with what I thought God was saying over here. And it all comes together to forge a path towards the doctrine. And the same thing with your decisions in life, it forges a path. And we'll talk about how we know good path, bad path. But let's continue on. Here it says in verse 7, it says, Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. This is a key for our prayer lives. I believe it to be the central key of prayer life. Depart from evil. We know, as it says, look over in, well, since we're in Proverbs, look at Proverbs 28.9 real quick. I have a lot of passages, so I better not talk too much. 28.9, Proverbs 28.9 says, and it, maybe it's jumping ahead of Maybe the last one in Psalm will cover will be more clear, but 28.9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. So a key, we're talking about keys to prayer lives, and sin and disobedience to God's word automatically shut down your connection. Shut down your connection, you know? Which is why if you ask somebody who you know is, has heard the truth and is blatantly rejecting the truth, walking away from the truth, but then they tell you, well, you know, I prayed about this thing and that thing. Yeah, don't put too much stock into it. Because it says, he that turns away his ear from hearing the law. That's just God's rules. Even his prayer shall be abomination. God's not happy about those prayers coming up. 
there's not much of a nice conversation going on. Look back at Psalm 66, 18. These are passages just to, just to remember. There are many, many, many that prove the point that sin is the great block between our prayers and Almighty God. Psalm 66, 18 says, if you don't already have it underlined, <clears throat> it's a principle. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you have sin in your life, unconfessed sin in your life, automatic prayer stopper. Another passage just as we're covering it, and I'm going to keep moving fast. Um, look at Isaiah 59.2. I remember covering this one in our Isaiah sermon series. There are many, though. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Right? God will not hear. It's a promise. When you've got sin in your life, he's not even hearing those prayers. So as we talk about having a strong prayer life, this is the key. This is the key. Having your heart right with God. And you find out when your heart's right with God, it really makes a lot of other things not even matter. For instance, how about um, multitude of prayers or length of prayers, etc.? Let's talk about this. While there, I don't want to get you wrong, I hope you pray a bunch. But is there anything miraculous about a, you know, praying a certain amount? Um, I believe the key is simply to be right with God. Look at James chapter 5, verse 16. And if you're right with God, you'll develop the perfect amount of prayers that should come forward. And I'll, I'll speak on that in a second. When you're right with God, He will lead you no matter what things um, we do, or we've acknowledged God, we've asked Him to direct our path, and He will. James 5.16 is an important verse on this one because this is the verse that says effectual fervent prayer. Watch. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I like this verse. I really like this verse, but every time that I quote this verse, you know what I think about? Everybody still with me? I'm moving too fast. Every, when I think of this verse, I always just remember the words, the effectual fervent prayer, which means you need to be praying, you know, and pray hard, pray with some vigor, really try to reach out to God. It's a fine thought. But the key actually that's listed here is what? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Again, it has to do with, is your heart right with God? Which shows me to, leads me to think some people are very fervent, fervent, fervent in their prayer. Praying, praying, praying. Got on their knees 20 times or six hours. Well, if their heart wasn't right with God, it, it didn't even avail. Didn't even get through. And that's the context of the whole verse. Confess your faults. Being right with God. Getting over sins. Of course, you confess your faults one to another. Not so that, that priest would forgive you. I was talking about among the brethren. A good way to get over a sin is to tell your brother or sister in the Lord that you have this problem you're struggling with. Can you help hold me accountable? It's a good principle. But yeah, no, we don't need to confess to man. Um, more keys about praying. What if we said, um, Lord, please lead me 100 times. What if 100 times we said, Lord, please lead me. Please help me make this decision. Lord, please lead me. Please help me make this decision. Lord, please lead me. Please help me make this decision. And we did it, we did it, we did it. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm preaching a lesson that I think I've struggled with in my life, and I think all of us have, is how can you develop a good prayer life? And I think it's really simple. One principle here in Matthew 6, 6 is not to get caught up in repetition. I'm sorry, the Catholics do it all the time. I think Baptists can as well. We think we'll be heard for much speaking. Look, 6-6. Six, six. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy, thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I do always like that concept. Your prayer life is really your private prayer life. It's not how eloquent you are in public. How well do you know your Father when you're in private? It, look at 7, though. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Catholics, of course, they get this down in print, do they not? They say, here's all the rosary, or here's you know this prayer, this prayer, this prayer, for whatever saint. They document their vain repetitions, which makes it easy for us to say, hey, that's wrong. 
But I, but some of us who grew up in church, do we not also hear the same vain repetitions again and again and again? And then it's, it turns kind of into a lucky charm, right? Oh, Lord, please leave me. Lord, help. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Ah, oh, Lord, help me. Oh, wait, stop. Lord, help me again. Lord, guide me. I'm not saying that can't be done with a good heart. I'm just saying, though, if we're counting on those little Lord helps me, Lord guide me, Lord guide me, Lord help me, and saying it a hundred times, we're probably missing the mark. Probably missing the mark. Because as we know, the key to prayer is being right with God. Being right with God. And it's not about a number of times we pray. I like this passage here because it leads right into the next point in Jesus' pattern for prayer. Look at verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Isn't that important? God knows what we need even before we ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. All those things, 9 and 10, tell me one thing. You're acknowledging God. You're acknowledging who he is. That he's in charge. He's the king. To me, that says that you know he already, you know that he already, he, he knows what you need. That's what I'm trying to say. And you know it. And you're just telling him, there you are, you're in charge. I acknowledge you. 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Which, by the way, Jesus gives a pattern here. And he doesn't give you a whole thing to vainly repeat. Because he just said that before, that we don't vainly repeat things, right? Some people pray this prayer as a vain repetition. And they miss the point right before it. It's a pattern. But give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This prayer, you even see the parts that you need. You see this for asking for forgiveness of sin, right? And we see praying for God's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Another key for praying, and the key for praying is asking for God's will to be done. We'll look at that in a second, but remember that. Be right with God and be looking for God's will. It says, I don't know how far we have, we'll go down to 13. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The prayer even concludes with a look at how of God's power and God's glory. Praising him in a simple prayer. That's what Jesus says the pattern should be. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine going to the Lord? Lord, I really need you to help me make this decision right now. I mean, would you flash the answer in my head right now? Um... Go for it, but the pattern here is, you know, thy will be done. Because you're worthy of all honor and glory and praise, and may you be glorified by what happens here, what decision is made. I think that's a recipe to actually strike oil. Let's continue on. Yeah. Yeah, we don't acknowledge God and we don't also acknowledge His will, which we'll talk about in a second here. We think a lot of times we go to God with the assumption that we already know God's will. God, you're supposed to do this. In fact, this proposition I'm giving you right now, it's all, it's all of God. Like, you tell me to go left or right. Well, God may say, hey, your whole proposition is wrong. I, I'm actually going to have you just wait. Or I'm actually going to have you turn around. He might have you. Sometimes we go to God and we're thinking that we know all the answers already. Like, here, God, here it is. Uh, option A, option B. There it is. I've set it up for you. Made it easy for you. Give you a 50-50 chance, God. <laughs> God may say your test is bunk. <laughs> I'm not involved with any of that test that you just set up. I think it's the truth. Look here at, um, well, don't look here. But let's, go, let's review. Let's talk about keys to prayer. Keys to prayer. And there's a, there's a pattern in the Bible. There is. I don't deny it. There's a pattern in the Bible of some people praying three times, right? Three times. But don't get caught up into the magic number three. I want to tell you. But, but just for full disclosure, uh, remember Daniel, he prayed three times a day. Paul prayed thrice that God would remove the thing from um, his, his, his body, the ailment. Other people pray three times. There's more, a lot more examples of the Old Testament people three, praying three times. I think even in Christ's story, there's a, a time when he prayed three times. I don't think there's anything magical about three, though. What I think it is, I believe this. And if you want to adopt a three, three-time prayer pattern in your life, I'll be okay with it. But this is what I think it should be. Our first prayer, because I, I noticed it with me. This is my prayer life, usually. And this is why sometimes it takes more than one prayer. Because the first prayer is to what? Get right with God. 
I mean, it'd be going no good and just asking for the answer right from the get-go if you got sin in your heart. No good. So a lot of times, my first prayer is to get right with God once it dawns on me. And that's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that could be prayer number one. Prayer number two, sometimes, is then we, we, ask, we got right with God, but we're still infatuated with what we think the answer is or with what we want. We're still infatuated. That's James 4, 3. It says, ye ask and receive not, James 4, 3, and receive not because ye ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust, right? So that could be prayer number two. Prayer number two is we write with God, but then we're just going to say, hey, God, you know what? Help me get this thing done. Help me do this thing that's right ahead of me. Not even asking if it's God's will or not. Finally, the third prayer might be after you realize you were in sin and that needed taken care of, after you realize you're asking for your will, not God's, the third prayer might sound like Luke 11, 2. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. When we get to that third prayer, um, it is a prayer of God, let your will be done. Help me not even think about, not even use my mind. Help me not even lean into any of the things that are already rattling in my head. When I know they're there. I think being honest with that is good too. God, you can tell God. God, I'm already thinking that I'm supposed to do this. I'm already thinking that you're supposed to do this. Help me wipe my mind clear and you just guide my steps to your will. Right? That's how I think the three prayer principle might actually play out in our lives. Not magical, but it might take us to get to the right prayer. Okay? I think that's truth. I think God has helped me understand some of that as in my own life. But if you have already, if you're already right with God and you already understand you're not looking for your will anymore, looking for God's will, then I, 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 I certainly believe God's hearing a prayer that you're asking God to do his will. Right? You cut right to the chase. Okay. I think in this vein, we are to um, work on developing a prayer life. The Bible tells us that we're to be instant in prayer. The Bible tells us that we are to pray without ceasing, Right? Develop a prayer life that is leaning on God, 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 not our thoughts. Look at Isaiah 55. I think the lesson is needful for me and you and our world because you can see where worldly philosophies of sign seeking and repetition kind of slip into our independent Baptist minds if we don't watch out for it, right? Signs in the head. I don't, I don't think it's a good thing. Lean not into your own understanding. We should be very careful about our own logic. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's interesting, isn't it? And let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The wicked, and Christians can be very wicked, we're to forsake our wicked way. It also says there that the unrighteous man is to forsake his thoughts. Leave your sin behind, leave your thoughts behind. Try to go to God with an empty slate, ready to do your will. Sometimes, yeah, as a church group and as we pray together, we're going to talk about that in a second. But everything we do, everything we do, should, it sh you should approach it with the, a with the aspect that these are just decisions all around us. And you approach them as that it's okay to look. It's okay to look. But we're going to pray and God's going to guide and direct, right? God's going to guide and direct. There's a shortcoming in life, and I don't know if I have uh, enough time or all the references to speak to it. There's a shortcoming in Christian faith as well, if I can speak to it, if God would leave me speak to it, that sometimes there's a hindrance to prayer life believing that God would never have us do anything. We assume we shortchange God. We say, oh, God couldn't open this door anyway, so I'm not even going to pursue it. We are also to pray in what? To pray in faith, believing that he can do what he says he'll do, or believing that he can move mountains. If we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can do some big things. Another key to prayer, which I hadn't written out here, is obviously to pray in faith, believing that God could accomplish something, could accomplish something. 
So I'm not, a, you know, I'm, I am not against Christians proposing big things to God or saying, God, would it be your will for me to be a missionary to Africa? I'm not opposed to it, right? God may then, as you pray that prayer, God starts guiding your life and directing your life because you asked in His will, you asked with a good heart. He may bring it to pass. Sometimes I think in the same vein that we lean into our own understanding, sometimes I think it really limits the things we pray about. Like for instance, this building. I, in my knowledge, the best I could think of was that we're gonna stay in the shop for another five years we're going to try to save as much as we can, and then we're going to put a down payment on that building I have in that little picture in there. Put a down payment, build a building up somewhere a little bit smaller. I had a whole, that was the best I could think of. Like, if God helps us do this, it'll be awesome. In 10 years, we'll have our own building. Well, we were praying, but maybe not as more, much as we should have now that we realize it. We could have been praying, God, just drop a huge building in our lap, would you? For 75000 please. Yeah. 100, yeah, yeah, 200, you're right, yeah. It was outlandish. But we shouldn't, if, if God, if our prayers in God's will, because we want to have a church that's visible, easy for people to visit, easy for us to raise the kids, it was all in God's will. I don't think it's wrong to pray those prayers. You know, and big things in your life, whatever it may be. God, I'm interested in your will for my work. You know, help me find a new job. I believe you could. Even take a situation that seems very permanent, change it. Housing situations may take a house to change it. Um, work with kids. I don't think I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not against thinking big in prayer. I think it shows faith. Ask him for something big. Ask him to completely overhaul your life, right? At, over, completely overcome the the sin that you've always been beset by, or overcome your personality type that's always just been more of a hindrance. I think there's a lot of independent Baptists that limit God and we should have more faith um, because if you think about it it's the exact same thing as leaning under your own understanding and this says right here watch 8 says for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways saith the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread of the either so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but shall accomplish that which I please it shall prosper into the thing whereunto I sent it God's in charge of everything and God's thoughts are so much grander than ours I think go to God with an open slate not God help me come up with my solution because I've determined this is the best solution the best solution is I've got to do this and then help me do it, Lord. I think we need to go to God with even bigger sight. God, I don't know what the solution is. You know, I thought maybe this might be a thing, but that's just my thought, Lord. So if that's not anywhere in the picture, just knock it out. And I want your will because your will will always be 1,000 times better. 1,000 times better. And think about that. Sometimes God's will and prayer, thy will be done, God's path, is 1,000 times better, and sometimes we can see it and sometimes we can't. You know that? That's a principle too, isn't it? Where we, even after we pray and after God leads, and we think, wait a second, God led me to here and now it's just a dead end. Or God led me to here and now I'm, I'm more confused than I was before. Take heart that you prayed and you acknowledge God. That he's still directing your path. And that's not over yet. I think the whole problem with prayer is that Christians, well, one, we're in sin. But two, we, we, we yield to our own will throughout the whole process. We start with our will. And then even let's say we, we, we knocked it down for a second and we started praying a true heart, Lord, do thy will. But then we start seeing God's will and then we, but then we start thinking about our own will. Like, wait, 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 God, you're doing this thing, but now it's not matching my original intent. You kind of got, you got mixed up. I didn't want this one. I wanted something else. The will, the will, the will gets in the way the whole way. It'll make you doubt God. It'll make you doubt that you ever acknowledge God or that he heard you because all of a sudden things are happening, but it's not how you wanted it to happen. We simply have to trust God. The key, acknowledge God and trust God. Trust that your prayer life works. It does work. It does work. It's not magic. It says, okay, now on that point, I, this, is, this is it to close it out. It really is. 
Because if you're like me, you're still wanting, you're still wanting something from God that tells you that your prayer got through. I mean, we can take, we should take God at His promises, and we should not be sign seekers. But I do believe there is something that God does send us to know that it's going to be okay. To know that um, He's going to handle it. I believe there is something. Let's look at Philippians chapter four. And I believe this simply because you see it in many, many, many parts of the Bible. I mean, you could see it one place, but it's really a theme of the whole Bible. Philippians chapter four, six. Philippians four, six. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, in supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The careful part is your will part. That's where you're carefully considering the problems, carefully considering your options and your solutions. And the Bible says, don't do that with anything. Do that with nothing. Stop caring about all those things. Instead, in supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. You say, God, it appears to me that this area has a hole. It appears to me, Lord, that this area is going to need a solution. And Lord, I need your solution. I need you to fill the hole. And what happens when we get through to God? It says seven, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I think that's real. I think that's what God gives you when you get through to him. I believe it. I believe in my life, I've made some decisions. Some, even in my mind, they seem to make sense, seem logical, right? But big decisions are scary. Talk about this, so I married, a, I married my wife, only wife I've ever had, um, until death do us part. We'll talk about that maybe later today. But I married my wife. Early on, dating, you know, I didn't have a clue. Didn't have a clue. But there came a point in time where I had simple peace. Like, yeah, this is the one I'm going to marry. It's done. It's over. There's nothing else to consider, right? Peace, right? God, I think that's God-given peace. If it wasn't the right woman, I believe I would never have had that peace. Um, but we prayed about it, acknowledged God. He sent peace. Buying houses, the place where I currently live, another big decision. Certain peace. Even though in that situation, as some of you know the story, there was nothing peaceful about the prospect. You know, they said we could never get it. The bank said we couldn't get it. Um, the realtor said we couldn't get it. Not a chance. The seller said they weren't going to sell it to us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we had peace that this is going to be the one for us. It seemed like it. God had just given us peace to sit on this one and not start jumping to a bunch of other ones. We could have started jumping to a bunch of other ones, right? Um, and then peace about finances. When we looked at it, there was like, there's no way we're going to be able to afford this thing. It's not going to work out. Um, God gave us peace, though, and then we sat. We sat because we had peace. That was where God wanted us to sit at the moment. And then he knocked down all the things that were logically impossible, all the things that if we leaned into understanding, we never would have came at. Those are big decisions. But anywhere in your life, I believe you pray, ask God to give you peace. Ask God, help me sit on the answer that is the peaceful one, that is the peace-filled one, the one where you want me to sit still on. And I think he'll do it. But in everything by prayer and supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through, through Christ Jesus. And God can give you different kinds of peace, right? It, like, again, on that option A, option B, we're asking God, you know, give me peace, this option. He may give you perfect peace just sitting right where you are. Or all of a sudden, as you acknowledge God, he brings in option C, which you never would have considered in your whole life. But option C pops in there and you have peace about option C. Yep. Prayer, I think, is immensely powerful when we get our weakness out of the way. All of our weaknesses, our sin, and our thoughts. I think intelligent people, which all you people are intelligent, and I want to tell you that this morning. There, I'm flattering you. Intelligent people have a problem with prayer because we come with so many ideas already. We've already thought this whole thing through. You know, we know this kind of stuff. We've been down this path before. I'll say another thing. A bane of experienced Christians, like older Christians in the Lord, 
a problem with them is they've seen everything before. I know that, and I know my own inclination. God, I've seen this situation before. I've seen this person act like this before, and then I saw what happened, and I, I know how to. I already know how to. I already know how to solve it. That's just leaning your understanding as well. That's not how. You know how the devil will trick us, thinking that every situation is always the same, always the same. Oh, this church member did this, then he's going to do this after this, and I should do this. Well, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you shouldn't. I, do you believe in that? I believe in that. I believe. Leaning into experience is the same thing as leaning into your own understanding. And while I don't knock people who have been through wars, it's good, especially if your wars are related to things you've learned in the Bible and you can actually apply in the Bible to problems. But leaning just to, yeah, I've seen it happen before. No, not going to work. That's just your own understanding. Anything that gives you reason to stop praying and to come to a, the conclusion already if you answer a matter before you hear it, everything, you're a fool. You know what I mean? All right. We ran completely out of time, but we did get to the end of the lesson. But I didn't get to the very end. I just simply wanted to say back to our Acts lesson, which is where we started, another principle about prayer. And I'll only look to Acts, although it is in other places, but look at Acts 2.42. 2.42. I said... Well, the day of Pentecost is here, and then at the end of the chapter, they start the first church. And what's the very first thing they do is they start the first church. It says 242, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. This church came together and prayed together. There's power in group prayer. There is. Not Pentecostal kind of power, but God likes the faith. God likes to see faith in people. So is it, a, is it a stretch to say God likes to see the faith of multiple people? No, it's certainly not. God likes to see that faith. 